in, uh, in Viroqua. But, uh, you know, two things I think about all those years, two things come to mind. And um, the first one is that God is faithful. God is faithful in the good times and the bad times. He's faithful. And, you know, his promise, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, that's absolutely true. And then the second thing that always comes to my mind is that the local church is God's plan. We need a local church. And, um, and we need to be together. We need to exhort one another, as the Bible says, encourage one another. And uh, we need to hear the Bible preached and we need to hear it taught. And, uh, you know, churches like this are getting rarer and rarer to find. And uh, so I, I thank God for Ambassador Baptist Church. I thank God for your faithful pastor. And, uh, and I'm, I'm praying for him as you all are too. But um, so let's rejoice that God is faithful. Let's rejoice that we have a local church to go to. All right, so what I want to speak about in um, our Sunday school time is this. Now that we're all saved, and I hope we all are this morning, I hope every one of us knows for sure that, yes, when I die, I'm going to heaven. Well, now that we're all saved, I ask a question. Can we lose our salvation? No. Well, let's, let's talk about that, because unfortunately, there are many people who think, yeah, yeah. Once you're saved, you know, you can actually lose it. Well, first of all, let's turn to a verse in um, the book of Titus. All right? I've really come to appreciate this verse uh, the last few years. Titus and chapter 1. And let's look at verse 2. Titus chapter 1. And I call your attention to verse 2. It says this, In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Don't you love that verse? It's fantastic. You know? And what do we learn here? We learn that eternal life is not some man-made fantasy. It's the promise from the God who cannot lie. In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. And so I want to ask this question. It says eternal life. Is eternal life eternal? Yes. Is eternal life eternal? Well, first, let's study the testimony of the Lord Jesus himself on that subject. All right? What did Jesus say on that subject? First of all, in John 6, and verse 37, Jesus said, I have, I have us look at other scripture, but in John 6, 37, Jesus said this, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. What is that telling us? That tells us that God will never cast us out of his family. If we come to Jesus, he will never cast us out. What a wonderful promise. I'd like you to turn now to John chapter 10. John chapter 10. And uh, I remember when I was first saved and reading the scriptures. And I'm going to tell you how I got saved in the morning service. But uh, when I came across these verses, I said, well, I've got to memorize these verses. And so these are, so these are some of the first verses, maybe the first verses I ever put to memory. They meant so much to me, and I, I'm sure they will to you as well. John chapter 10, and let's go down to verse 27. John 10, verse 27. Let's listen to what Jesus said on this subject of eternal life, all right? Here's what he said. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them unto me is greater than all, 
And no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Oh, listen, Jesus makes it clear that no man can cause you, can cause me, to lose my salvation. To lose your salvation. No man can cause us to lose our salvation. So, God won't cause you to lose your salvation. He will never cast you out of his family. No man is able to make you lose your salvation. But what about yourself? Can you do something to lose your salvation? Well, first of all, let's just consider a few things. First of all, let's remember that the Bible tells us salvation is by grace through faith and not of works. It tells us that it is a gift from God. All right? It is something that God does for us. The Bible is very clear. It says salvation is of the Lord. It says that several times. And I'm sure we all know Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, right? For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So salvation is something that God does. We don't do it. Now, turn over to Philippians chapter 1. And let's once again be told by God himself that salvation is something that he does. Paul writes this in Philippians 1, and take a look at verse 6. Philippians 1 and verse 6 says, being confident, I like that, being confident, in other words, have full assurance in what I'm about to tell you, being confident of this very thing, what is it, what is this thing, here it is, that he, that's God, which hath begun a good work in you, will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. That's talking about salvation. God has begun a good work in you. If you came to Christ and received him as your Lord and your Savior, he saved you and he's going to complete that work. All right? So salvation, let's, let's remember. Salvation is something that God does. We don't do it. We don't do it. So that brings up this. There's a few verses in the scriptures that tell us if we had to do something, if we had to do something to earn our salvation, and if we had to do something to keep our salvation, we would very easily lose it. Very easily. Let's take a look at a couple scriptures. Let's go to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. I have you turn in your Bibles because I don't want you to fall asleep, right? That's how I keep you awake. Galatians chapter 3. And let's look at verse 10. Look what it says here in Galatians 3 and verse 10. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. In other words, if we put ourselves under the law and say, I'm going to be saved by keeping the law then guess what? We've brought ourselves under a curse. Here's why. Because it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. So if we are coming to God saying, we're going to keep the law to earn our salvation, yeah, we're going to stay saved by keeping the law. Then guess what we're doing? We're bringing ourselves under a curse because no one is able to keep the law. All right? Here's another verse, James chapter 2 and verse 10. Well, let me just quote it for you. James 2 and verse 10 says this, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. 
So when it comes to salvation, listen, it's of the Lord. And if we had to do something to earn it, and if we had to do something to keep it, we would lose it so easily. But let's not put ourselves under the law. We're under grace now. Salvation is by grace through faith, right? So, what about this, though? Well, let me just read another verse that gives us great assurance about God doing it all and not us trying to keep it. In 2 Timothy 1.12, Paul gives a little testimony. He says this, For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. What did Paul commit unto the Lord? His very soul. And he says, he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. All right? But what about this, though? People will say, well, what if I sin? If I, if I sin, you know, to, the, to, to such an extreme way, and I, can I sin away my salvation? So many are worried about that. Let's turn over to Romans chapter 5, because Paul answers it so, so specifically and so clearly. All right? Can we sin our salvation away? Romans chapter 5, and I want you to go down to verse 20. Romans chapter 5, verse 20, and we'll read verse 21. Notice what he says. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, you know what abounded means? It means that it's, wow, it's running free. It's, it's excessive. It's huge. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin had... That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Well, can we send our salvation away? God's grace is greater than all our sin. We are saved by the riches of His grace. And so... Does anybody have a troubled heart and say, oh, but you don't know. You don't know how I've stumbled last week. You don't know how I've fallen in the few days since we met again. I say to you that where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. No, we are saved by the riches of God's grace. We cannot sin our salvation away. Let's remember this. 1 Peter 1, 5 says, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. What keeps you saved? Your own power, your own ability, your own goodness, your own righteousness. Then you're putting yourself under the law. No, you're kept by the power of God. Through faith, it says. Right? Simply by trusting, trusting Christ. Oh, what a salvation. What a salvation the Lord has given us. Now, Let's talk about and review what we just said. God will never kick us out of his family, right? Jesus said, him that cometh to me, I will no wise cast out. And, uh, you know, in the Greek there, in that verse, John 6, 37, he says, I will in no wise cast out. It's like in a, a double negative. It means I will never, no, never cast out. He emphasizes that. Right? So God won't cast us out of his family. No man is able to cause us to lose our salvation. No man is strong enough because we're held in God's hand. No man is able to pluck us out of God's hand. And then thirdly, we can't. We can't lose it by sinning. Because where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. 
So the answer is no, we can't lose our salvation. And now let's turn to something that Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8 that's so thrilling and uh, really puts the um, emphasis so that we can really see it. Paul says we cannot lose our salvation. He says, I'm persuaded that we can't. Romans chapter 8, and let's just look at what he wrote in verse 38 and 39. All right, Romans chapter 8, verse 38 and 39. Paul writes and he says, For I am persuaded that neither death... Hey, you can't lose it when you die, nor life, you can't lose it while you're alive, nor angels, angels can't take it from you, nor principalities, the government can't take it from you, nor powers, the devil can't cause you to lose it, nor things present, nothing right now can ever take it away nor things to come nothing in the future can make you lose it nor height nothing above you nor depth nothing below you and then he says nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord Paul was persuaded are you are you? Now, why is this? Why are we so secure? Let's talk about that. Why are we so secure? First of all, because our relationship with God is now a father-son, father-daughter relationship. Why are we so secure? Because our relationship is now a father-son, father-daughter relationship. Would you turn to John chapter 1? Let's look how this is explained. John chapter 1. And we're going to look at verse 12 and 13. John chapter 1. And go down to verse 12. We're all familiar with verse 12, aren't we? What a wonderful salvation verse. And you can use it to evangelize very well. It tells us what to believe in Christ means. It means you receive him, right? Let's see. It says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power or authority to become the sons of God even to them that believe on his name. Then he says, which were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. We were born into God's family. How do you become a child of God? You received Jesus. But as many as received him, to them give you the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. How do I become a child of God? What does it mean to be born again? It means to be born into God's family. How are you born into God's family? By receiving His Son, Jesus, as your Lord and your Savior. Why are we so secure? Because we now have a father-son, father-daughter relationship with God. We've actually been born into His family. Now, let's think about this. When you were born physically, there was a record made of your birth called a birth certificate. And when you were born again, there was also a record made. Let's look at a couple of verses here in 1 John 5. Would you go there? 1 John 5. These verses are so clear. And so wonderful just to trust. Just take God at his word. That's all he asks us to do. That's what faith is. Just taking God at his word. And look at these wonderful verses. 1 John 5. 
And we're going to read verse 11, 12, and 13. If you haven't put these verses to memory, go ahead and do it. They'll comfort your heart. 1 John 5, verse 11. And this is the record. Record. That God hath given us, or given to us, eternal life. And this life is in His Son. He that hath the Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. And then verse 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that you have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Yeah, when we were born physically, there was a record made. Right? And when we're born again, there's a record made. The Bible tells us that there's actually a book in heaven called the book of life. And that our names are written in that book. And our names have been written in it even before the foundation of the world. And the Bible tells us, oh, one sad day, there's going to be a judgment. The great white throne judgment. Right? And there are going to be people on that day that are going to see that book opened. And I believe they're going to frantically look for their name to see if it's there. But there will be no record of their birth in that book of life. But listen, if you have, if you have come to God through Jesus, His Son, if you have received Jesus as your Savior, you have life. Your name's in that book of life. There's a record of it. Okay? How precious that is. And then, also, think about this. Your birth certificate is marked with a seal, right? I mean, over the years, there's been times we've moved or something has changed. I've needed something. Anyway. I need my birth certificate. Where is that thing? And you frantically search for your birth certificate, and you, and you, you find it, and, you, and there's a seal on it, right? I mean, I couldn't, I, if somebody said, give me a birth certificate, I couldn't just write on a piece of paper. Well, I was born on uh, uh, September 15, 1953 and handed in. No, it's got to be official. It's got to have that, that seal on it. Well, guess what? Our new birth has been sealed as well. We have a seal, and it's a person, the Holy Spirit, right? Uh, you know the verses, Ephesians 1. Verse 13 says this, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth. Right? Isn't that what happened? We trust after we hear the word of truth. The gospel of your salvation. In whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Yeah, we have a seal upon our birth. We're sealed with the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4 and verse 30 says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Do you have that seal? Does the Holy Spirit live within you? Paul wrote in Romans 5, 9, that if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So, if you're saved today, the reason... You know you're saved is the work of the Holy Spirit. You know? The Spirit, Paul wrote, beareth witness with our spirit, telling us that we are the children of God. So, just as our physical birth, a record was made and there was a seal, well, our spiritual birth has also been sealed. Sealed with a person. We have the Holy Spirit of God now. And, uh, you know, think about this. Uh, for assurance of our salvation, we have two strong things. No, first of all, we have the objective, factual truth of God's Word that we can read. As we just read in 1 John 5, 11-13, that he that has the Son has life. And so many other scriptures, we have that. And then the second thing is the subjective truth that's within us, the sealing of the Holy Spirit. We have someone living within us <laughs> who gives us that sweet assurance that we belong to Jesus. Right? 
Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Do you have the Holy Spirit if you're saved? You have him. And he gives you sweet assurance. Well, let's understand this also. <laughs> you can never be unborn. Your birth is fixed forever. Right? You can never be unborn once you're born. That's how secure you are. Once again, 1 Peter 1, 5, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Yeah, when you're born, you can't ever be unborn. Well, now some people, sometimes I have some questions. All right? And uh, let me talk about that for just a minute. Sometimes people will say, well, how can I know? I mean, really know that I'm saved. Well, the epistle of 1 John, for example, was written for that very reason. And we looked at it already, but let's remember what 1 John 5.13 says. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that you have eternal life. He said, I've written something to all of you who have put your faith in Jesus Christ. So that you can know. You can have that certainty. One more verse on that. Turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 20, please. I compare this with 1 John 5, 13. John, chapter 20, and go down to verse 31. John, chapter 20. In verse 31, look what the blessed gospel of John says. John, who also penned 1 John 5, 13, also penned this, John 20, verse 31. But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. The Bible was written so that you and I might have assurance. The Bible was written for, so that every one of us who has put our faith in Jesus Christ might have assurance and confidence that we have eternal life. Not temporary life, eternal life. Well, what about this? Some people will say, but what if I don't feel saved? Right? What if I don't feel saved? Well, listen, your salvation is not based on feelings. It is based upon the objective, factual truth of the Word of God. Now, let's look at a verse that I think answers that question very clearly. Let's go to 1 John chapter 3. Someone says, well, what if I don't feel like I'm saved? Well, once again, salvation is not based on feelings. It's based on the objective, factual truth of God's Word. And let's look what's stated here in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 20. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 20. Let's notice what it says. For if our heart condemn us, we think or feel unsaved. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Listen, God knows that you're saved even if you don't. But listen, your salvation is not based on how you feel. <laughs> Maybe you say, I don't feel saved, then go turn to the Word of God and turn to scriptures like 1 John 5 and read it. And this is the record that God has given to us eternal life. And this life is in His Son. He that has the Son has life. And he that has not the Son of God has not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that ye may know. I like that. You may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. And Titus 1-2, as we began with, says, In hope 
of eternal life, which God that cannot lie. <laughs> God can't lie. Promise before the world began eternal life is the promise of the God who cannot lie. Folks, just believe what God has said. Just believe. 1 John 2.25 and this is the promise that he hath promised us, even eternal life. Do we have a couple of minutes left? What time do we go till? Just one more thing. Turn to John 3.16, the most familiar verse of all. I want to just emphasize two words in John 3.16 that I believe provide sweet assurance to John 3 and verse 16. John 3, verse 16 says this, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Now, two words I want to emphasize. The first word is world. It says, For God so loved the world. Let me ask you something. Are you part of the world? How can you exclude yourself from that word, from the world? You can't. And so if God so loved the world, that means he loves you. He loves you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The second word is whosoever. Oh, I'm so glad that word, whosoever, is there. What does it mean? It means anybody. I'm glad that word is there. It's better to have that word there than to read my own very name. Do you know that? Because if, my, if it said for Roy Talir, guess what? I'd have to say, which Roy Talir is he talking about? Now, I got kind of an unusual name. I've never met anybody else that was called Roy Talir. But guess what? When I Google it, I find there's a lot of Roy Talirs around. A lot of them. Do that on Facebook, right? Look up somebody and say, oh, with 10 different people with the same name, you know? So if it had said Roy Talir instead of whosoever, I might say, <laughs> who did he mean? Did he mean me or someone else with my name? No, he didn't say that, though. He said, whosoever. That means anybody. Anybody. That's you, okay? God loves you. He sent his son to die for you. If you will believe on him, you will have everlasting life. You can't lose your salvation. God is stronger. And he keeps us, not by our own power, but by the power of God. How blessed, huh? Well, may God bless you. Amen.